Now, when you were in China uh, in the late 2000s working uh, with the, you know, different businesses and, and traveling around, what made you realize that the Chinese Communist Party was a threat? I mean, because you were working with businesses that wanted to work with the Chinese Communist Party. Right. Right. So if you're and this this is something that I don't think a lot of people in the United States understand, at least writ large, that if you're doing business in China, right, you have to deal with the CCP. There, there's no way around it. Right. Every company has party members in it. Every deal maker um, has to get blessed off by the CCP at some point. There has to be whether it's provincial, whether it's regional, whether it's national. You all need the blessing. You need someone. Right. You need someone with guanxi. Right. You need someone with and that's that's, you know, it's it's so um, hard for a lot of Westerners to understand the concept of guanxi, which it doesn't doesn't just mean you're well connected. Right. You need to have good guanxi as well. Right. You need to have like a positive. Um, so it's like your your reputation and your connections and your your power and your what your your influence all combined. And of course, that's going to come up with party connections. That's all part of increasing it. This is the way the CCP has kind of injected themselves as the locus of success in China, right? So yes, they have these sort of market forces, but the only pathways to achieving that final success or achieving um, your degree of, you know, rising yourself up or if you have a company you're building, wh whatever it is you're doing, or in the military, if you're scientist at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, right? Right. You have to go through the party process at some point. And that when someone's kind of like on their way up on their as a rising star, someone from the party will reach out to you or you'll be asked to go to a meeting and then you're offered membership. And, you know, there's this huge process to get in. And it's it's seen as an honorific, right? It's seen as uh, you are now part of the one percent. Right. That's that's the way to look at the CCP. Right. That's your right of entry. And that's that's if you don't have like a, you know, a family background or or one of these other sort of like endemic pathways in. And so coming from my background, just, you know, I'm I'm Polish, um, you know, born in the US, my family's Polish. So, you know, I've I've always had a very, very dark view of communism, but in many ways a very clear view of communism and knowing what it did to Poland and what it did to Eastern Europe. And understanding that this is a problem that and a force that should not be trifled with. And they have a completely different set of values than than we would in the West. They don't believe in civil rights. They don't believe in human rights. They don't believe in the value of human life. They don't believe in uh, the same set of morals that, um, you know, individual morality as we would in the West. And so when you start asking those types of questions, I'll give you an example, actually. I'll give you a good example. This is a story I tell sometimes. So we had in Shanghai, they have, they, they call it the Shanghai Planning Museum, right? And what's the Shanghai Planning Museum? Well, the Shanghai Planning Museum is the municipal, it's almost like a, like a part think tank, part nerve center, part party apparatus building. It's right down from the Shanghai Museum where when you go there and it's not open to the public, right? You have to be invited in. That is where the city planners of Shanghai decide what they are going to do with the city next. They decide what deals are going to happen, what infrastructure is going to be built, um, what, uh, uh, what new, you know, the, the Shanghai World Expo was coming in. So any big exhibits or events that are going on at all, it all runs through there. So we would bring over U.S. politicians sometimes and whether it be, um, senators, congressmen on a, a CODEL congressional delegation, or whether it be just their staff or a lot of a lot of state officials, so state governors would come by. And we'd always take them through this place, the Shanghai Planning Center. And as they would go through, they'd look at all these amazing, expansive mega projects, right? And and of course, China's known for its mega projects, right? Three Gorges Dam is like the biggest one that, they, that they're well known for. But they would say, wow, look at these, look at, look at what you can do. And you can just just move this and you set this up and man, yeah, you got maglevs here and you've got this nuclear plant and you just set this up and you set all of these different things up and boom, and it happens and it's, and it's incredible and it's intoxicating to them. And it was like, they were getting drunk on the amount of power that they realized that the CCP had, because you don't have to worry about 
zoning restrictions or eminent domain. There's no eminent domain. The party owns everything, right? There's no, you don't have to worry about the getting funding from the bank. If this thing's approved, then boom, you've got all the funding you need. You don't need to worry about environmental considerations. You don't need to worry about, and if people are living in the area, well, <laughs> get rid of them, right? They don't want the maglev there. Well, then they're not going to be there anymore. Oh, these are historic Shurkuman buildings, right? These old, um, you know, very culturally significant um, living quarters that people have lived in in Shanghai for hundreds of years. Knock them down. Get them out of the way. We need progress, right? And you, Michael Bloomberg is a great example of that, right? Because he's sort of one of the most prominent members of what I would call the technocratic, you know, Acela corridor class in the United States where it is intoxicating to them when they look at that system and they say, look, it's all top down. We don't need to worry about these annoyances anymore. We don't need to worry about these little people and their little problems. We have big ideas, big innovation, big plans. And with this model, with this, this is, and this is what Charlie Munger is talking about, right? I, I know exactly what Charlie Munger is talking about when he says that. That's the model that he wants because he wishes, they all wish, that they could have that much power in the United States, in the West, to get done whatever it is that their their scope of their dreams is. And so when I started reflecting back on realizing that this is the situation that's going on, that this is they want the Chinese model. They want the CCP model. They're not coming over and talking about how great it is to have democracy and civil rights. You, you never even have that discussion, right? So I would see them come through and they're getting introduced to it. They're getting a taste of it. And so when Elon Musk, great example of this, Elon Musk tweets just a few nights ago as Xi Jinping is giving his, you know, uh, saber rattling speech there in, in the Mao Garb at the Tiananmen Gate, that Elon Musk says, Wow, if people could just visit China and see what they're doing, particularly in terms of infrastructure. Well, they would they would have their eyes opened the same way I did. I'm like, Elon, I bet I know exactly how you got your eyes opened when you were in Shanghai, when you were in China. It's the exact same thing. It's basically like a twisted version of SimCity. It is kind of like SimCity. Yeah, you could that's a great way of putting it. And it's and it's like, you know. Whoever played a game of SimCity that it didn't end in some some disaster or another, right? Yeah, it was the same idea. You don't have to worry about the Sims, like if you tear down a building or ha put a nuclear power plant somewhere. That's why I love SimCity. The, the power was intoxicating. I just destroyed everything and it was fine. I could rebuild in my own image. <laughs> Beautiful. Right, I had I had Poso City, and then here's the the Poso <laughs> Castle, Poso Palace. All right, we're gonna put that there. This here. Now, what about the people who live on Main Street? I don't like Main Street anymore. Get rid of it. Make it gone. Now it's Poso Place, right? You know, it's, yeah, it's it's like Sim City. It's exactly like Sim City, actually. Wow, I can't wait to have that glorious system here in the U.S. Imagine a world where you don't own anything. The thing is, when we get that system in the U.S., we aren't going to be the ones at the keyboard and the controls, right? People like Charlie Munger, people like Elon Musk, they're going to be, uh, Michael Bloomberg, Pete Buttigieg, you know, I thought I love Pete Buttigieg, right? You're going to be the Secretary of Transportation, right? Well, what do you know about that? You're the mayor of you know some town in uh, in Indiana. What do you what do you know about uh, transportation? You know, I've I've always been a fan of transportation, <laughs> <laughs> it, and it doesn't matter, right? He is a man of the new system. He is a technocrat. That is exactly the type of person we are talking about, where they are not in it. They're not in it for, so. and and then of course, wokeness, and not to get too off uh, topic on that, but wokeness gives them this amazing example of kind of deflecting from talking about anything they're doing. You know, let's not talk about where Elon Musk is getting his cobalt, right, from uh, the blood mines of Africa and VW and where all the materials that they're they're sourcing are and how they're getting it from the strip mining in Africa um, for these electric cars. No, 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 no. It's wokeness, right? Wait, 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 wait. Well, what, what about those those child mines that you guys are using? Excuse me. Is that your white privilege talking? And then they boom, they can just deflect right away from it and they can say you're part of the problem that you need to get with the solution. And they have this ready made for them where they can talk about and, you know, it's Pride Month and they can all put up the flag and talk about that all day long. 
to completely distract you from what's actually going on behind the scenes. And meanwhile, companies like Nike is lo lobbying or Apple lobbying against Uyghur slave labor bills. Right. Because it's part of their supply chain and they don't well, want to Disney, talk And about Disney that. is thanking them. Disney, thank you so much to the Xinjiang Party Committee for allowing us to shoot the film Mulan here in, you know, here just, just what is it, you know, miles away from the concentration camps. But fortunately, we were able to set it up in such a way that we angled our cameras so that you wouldn't be able to see uh, the million people who are locked up.